And I think it's really interesting and, and beautiful that each of you has this uh, unique approach to music and how it applies to your writing. And I think on a broader context, I was curious, like how music influences Anthony, you you spoke earlier about how um, there is no culture without music. And I'm curious how we'll start with you, Anthony, how music becomes sort of an integral part of your world building and what that brings to the stories that you write. Um, I think it has to be there. Um, I mean, music is often married to religion in some ways, and I write a lot about religion. Um, you know, fake religions, not real ones. But also it's, when it crops up, it tends to be in the sort of calmer moments, it tends to be in the reflective moments. Uh, or it's something that adds to a particular character. I mean, uh, my, the most recent book I finished, which is a, the sequel to The Pariah, there's a character who's he sings uh, and makes up her own songs. Uh, but she, we learned that this was something she learned to do in childhood because she had an abusive parent. Uh, but if she sang, then her abusive parent would, you know, become calm and leave her alone. And it's something she just carried on in a child, into adulthood, you know. Uh, so in that sense, I tend to use it when it's a musical character. It's there has to be some reason why they're musical, you know. If they're a warrior, there has to be a reason why they're a warrior and so on. So that's tend to how I, how I approach it in terms of uh, lacing it into the, uh, the backstory of the characters and so forth. The songs themselves, the ones that are made up, they, you know, they're there to add a dramatic punch to something or, you know, just illustrate the mood of the scene. Uh, I tend not to do the Tolkien thing of going on for page after page of lyrics and so on, because I think people can get a bit bored with that. Uh, and frankly, I'm not capable of writing that many lyrics anyway. But yeah, that, that's basically how I go about it. Well, I think, I think the Tolkien thing is, uh, there are few people who would approach uh, poetry and, and lyricality in that context these days, because I have met people who have read Tolkien today in the last few years and they said like I have to skip over the poetry and for me it's like oh man those are so beautiful you know the first time I read them when I was when I was 10 or 11 so much flew over my head but the poetry and and the songs sank in you know that's why I remember Tom Bombadil so so fondly and was pissed off when he wasn't in the Fellowship of the Ring movie (laughs) Personally, but, I was kind um, of relieved. <laughs> it's just, it's just unnecessary baggage. But you know, and what about you, Juliet? How how would you go about? Um, you've you've spoken about it a little bit, but how how do you approach music from a world building standpoint? Yeah, well, I think because uh, yeah, because they're based on close close to real historical settings, not quite you know tweaked magical versions of historical settings. Um, I do tend to use the the kind of music that would have existed in in that society, but um, yeah. So the music music is often used in a in a ritual way, whether it's by Christian or or Druid communities, and so there's a certain amount of chanting and so forth. And then there's the the, the music of the common of the ordinary people, secular music. Um, it's just built. It's built into the society, and um, then occasionally there'll be, you know, I'll do something different. I wrote a series called Shadowfell, which is probably one of the only ones that I've written that doesn't fit into real history anywhere. They can tell that it's a thinly disguised version of Scotland called Alban, but um, it's not. It's not any real real time in history. And um, there's a tyrannical king on the throne, and there used to be a song called the, um, the Song of Truth, which everybody knew and everybody sang, and it's really the story of the people and, and their history. It's, it's like uh, the Marseillaise and, uh, you know, in the resistance. You can't sing it you, if, you, if you make the mistake of, you know, humming it while you're chopping up the veggies and someone hears you, then you can be put to death for that crime. It's, 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 a, it's a symbol of, you know, resistance against the, the authorities. And... Um, 
build into that novel. It's a novel about a, 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 a rebels, you know, challenging, eventually working through to challenge the king and someone who's able to draw human and magical folk together to work to work together, which they normally complete distrust between the two. And um, that song crumbs up several times when our central character sings it. Um, she's asked to sing it. You know, she's, the ghosts of the slain warriors come back and ask her to, to sing the song that's been forgotten and then they ask her to go and fight. Um, she, like the other characters I've mentioned, also uses it to, well, she uses it to cross a bridge at long, one of those bridges that I'd be terrified about. Very high, chasm beneath the river at the bottom, narrow, slippery, single log, you know, and there's this monster creature at the other end kind of laughing as if to say, oh, you come closer and we'll just give you a and you'll go down. Um, but there's a mention of a song, and she knows what song the monster wants to hear. It's not a monster. It's a creature called a brolican. Um, and so she walks across and balances across, and she sings the song. And because it's that song, even though he plays a bit with her on the way, he tips her over the edge and catches her by one ankle and hangs her up and swings her around a bit. But she gets across because she's singing the song of freedom, and that's the key. Um, so, you know, that, that particular thing is built into that, that story. But really I think it's just I'm writing about communities that had music, and so the music inevitably is going to be in there as, as part of the story, whether it's magical or whether it's just what they do in their daily lives. Something to bind people, to join people. Yeah, and I think that ties into what Anthony's saying is that, you know, music is is this inevitable part of of um let's say systems that form whether it's the system of a community or a religion or a family unit you know in the case of anthony's character where she uses singing as a coping mechanism against uh someone who's abusive music acts as this uh connective tissue but also as a protective tissue at the same time so it's connective and protective and it's this like binding agent let's say for for different communities and and sebastian what is your what is your perspective on on music from a world building standpoint well so i I already described a bit of how it plays in the great coats in sort of very kind of literal ways um in the argosi books and the spell slinger books so the for people who don't know the series the argosi are kind of for me they're almost like the anti-jedi you know, in Star Wars, the Jedi, you know, are these very, uh, they have to they have to be born with a connection to the force and it's all about magic and control and, and, um, and, and they have to distance themselves from human emotions. And, and so I wanted to write, you know, the Argosia as, as ultimately human. And so there's these, there are these wandering sort of philosopher gambler types, um, who somehow managed to survive even in a world where there's tons of magic and tons of people out to get them specifically because they develop all of their human skills, the things we can all do into what they call the seven talents. And so one of the seven talents is, is called uh, Art Eloquit, which is the, the talent for eloquence. Um, and they use eloquence, which for them is, is driven by music, even though it's not doesn't have to manifest as notes or melodies. But this notion of eloquence and musicality as a, as a kind of a superpower, as a, as a sort of talent. And so for example, uh, Farius, the main character, will sometimes describe it as, you know, when you have a conversation with someone, a conversation, even a conversation where someone's out to get you, uh, is a song that they're trying to perform, and you're, you're performing it together. And so if you understand the musicality, if, you have the, if you've developed your talent for art eloquent, for eloquence, you can help shape that song without having it to be a, a, a sort of a clash of ideas. And so there's a there's a scene in the second Spellslinger book, uh, Shadow Black, in which Farius, the, the mentor um, for this for Kellen, who who's from a magical culture, and she's sort of teaching him the Argosi ways. She has this conversation, this very long, like hour long conversation with a, a, an expert in in a in a sort of a scientific field, in which that expert thinks that she's also an expert in it, and at the end. Kellen's sort of like, how do you know all of this stuff? And she's like, what are you talking about? I've never heard of any of this stuff before in my life. And he's like, but it seemed like you knew. And, and she said, no, he, he wanted to have a conversation of showing how brilliant he was. Um, and that was the song he wanted to play. And I played the silences. Um, 
you know, so I play the, you know, the, mm hmm, yes. Uh, oh, well, I'm interested in what you said about that. You know, you're almost like an interviewer in a way to sort of draw it out of him. And, and so she gets all the information she's trying to get about this other mystery that's going on while allowing this person to perform the song they want to have. And so in that sense, you know, music is, again, I go back to that thing about even when people are fencing, they, they naturally develop a, a kind of a rhythm that becomes sort of a dance. And I think in all of our conflicts and our, dia our dialogues, even when you hear, you know, people railing against each other and, and sort of, you know, start setting off a war, they're, they're sort of competing over what song is being played, right? Um, and so that's something that kind of, uh, that, that always just interests me. And, and for me, the, the, the reason to write fantasy has never been because I want to write about magic or castles. It's because fantasy allows you to, um, as, as I think Anthony alluded to earlier, to, to define other cultures, to ask the question, not just what if we, you know, had different, you know, supernatural beings around, but what if our culture worked differently? You know, what if we had, you know, I always use this example, if uh, when you go to Paris and you sit in a cafe and you watch people go by, sometimes in, when there, that's in, the, in other cities too, you'll see this where there's these people come by with roses and try to sell you roses. And, and I thought, oh, you know, what if there was something else? What if there were salt girls like who, who came by with these, who just walked by the cafes with these trays of exotic salts and because everybody, you know, valued flavoring their food so much that, you know, you would buy a specialty salt from them and to, to put on your food. Like fantasy allows you to kind of do those things. And, and for me, I think music um, is often the thing that propels me to those questions and those ideas because music is such a, sort of almost, I don't want to, I don't want to sound too highfalutin here, but you know, it, it, it's, it's transcendental in the sense that it takes your, the way that your brain is working out of its day to day, which is, I think why so many people sometimes even listen to it at work, right? Because they, in order to function, they need to kind of get their brain out of all of their other concerns so that they can kind of think differently about it. So, and that's certainly the case for me with writing process. I, I use music as a way to get my brain to be working differently.